Hello everyone and welcome to another episode of 180 Briefs. In 1972, something amazing happened, besides my birth. Um, in 1972, you had the first home video game system console released. It's called the Odyssey. Never heard of it until recently. I've never heard of the Odyssey. Uh, I thought it was a book. But anyway. But my next door neighbor had one device and it played Atari Pong. That's all it did was just had Pong. So you had just a couple dials and you just watched the lines go back and forth on your screen as the little ball, which was a square, would bounce back and forth. And you tried to get into each other's goal. Kind of like air hockey. But then my dad surprised me and my brother with this amazing device called the Atari 2600. And it was really cool because it had tons of games. The little cartridges, well, if you consider that little, you would shove in there and you play all different kinds of games that looked like a kid drew them on a storyboard. But it was fun and you s used your imagination to picture what these games were really doing. Uh, this little figure that was trying to pretend it was Indiana Jones later in the 80s and all these different games of combat and missile command and space invaders and all that fun stuff that we enjoyed playing. And then technology grew. You had things like ColecoVision, Intellivision. You then had things that I didn't like. Sorry, you're all going to freak out. But I was never a fan of NES or any other Nintendo brand. But that's okay. Um, I liked things like the Sega Genesis, which of course then later got bought out by Nintendo. But that's another story for another time. Um... But as time went on, you started seeing the graphics getting better and better, and the storylines getting better and better, and you had the people like write storylines as if they were writing a movie. But as you got older into the games, you started seeing things where if you were I'm gonna use a, a first shooter game where you know it's you in a war scene and you're running around shooting or whatever. But what you see on the screen besides your enemies and all that is you have your resources. You got your life bars showing you, you know, anytime you've gotten hit by something and your health just starts going down and down and down, you have your ammunition or whatever resource, depending on what kind of game it is. But then you would have your, in this situation, the army type games, you have the guy running across the screen and above his head, there's a bar, his health bar. Once you start shooting at him, and then you start seeing it going down, 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 down until the guy goes dead, and you start hunting down your next target. And there's other uh, scenarios where maybe you find someone, if you're doing a role-playing type game, you walk around and you see someone that has something above their head to let you know that you need to talk to them or give them something to you know for exchange or whatever. What if... God came to you and said, I'm going to do something like that for you. I'm going to open your eyes to people's needs. And the one night you decide to go for a walk, you're walking in your neighborhood, it's just you, maybe you and your dog or whatever. And as you're walking down the street, you see a woman that is walking her dog. And suddenly above her head, it says to you that she's depressed, she's losing hope and losing faith in humanity, and she's lonely. And because you see that, you go up to her and just say hi and smile at her. And suddenly you see above her head, like the meter starting to show that she's starting to have more hope. She's starting to have, you know, excitement that, hey, someone actually cares about me. Even though it was just a smile or just a, a wave or some kind of acknowledgement. You walk further down the street and you see above a house it flashing. And you see it says, George, 82 years old, has fallen and can't get up, needs medicine and emergency services. And you go over there, you come to his front door, you look down at the, uh, the, um, 
the welcome mat and it lights up in the corner. You open it and you see a key. You grab the key and you put it in the lock and open it and knock on the door. Hey, George, it's Steve from up the street. Um, I just had a feeling you needed help with something. I'm coming in. And you go in and you see him laying there and he's trying to reach for his medication. And you get it. You help him up. You get the medication. You give it to him. Call 911. And he survives. You go down the street another time and you see again the house flashing and it says fire and the people are asleep and you see the flames in the window and you call 911 and you kick the door in and you start waking everybody up and getting them out of the house or maybe you're walking down the street and you see a person standing there and you can see their something's wrong and then you see above their head flashing they just need 10 bucks to get it to fill their car with just some gas just so they can get to their job before they get fired because they've been warned several times and they just need to make it to the next day because the next day it's payday and so you give them ten dollars and they are then able to get their job wouldn't that be cool if you saw those type of notifications, would you help? Or like many of us who do see signs, not like that, but you know, you see that someone's struggling, you hear someone struggling and sometimes we're like, well, someone else will help them. But if you had signs that they were that obvious and God's like flashing it in your face like this, like unnecessary zoom, like I am doing it to the screen right now, would would that make you help more? Well, as you go throughout this week, I hope that you become a little more aware. Pay attention to the people around you. Listen. Pray to God that he will give you those imaginary signs above people's heads or a whisper in your ear or just a, you know, as you're walk, walking past them that, the Holy Spirit just grabs your legs and locks on until you realize, hey, God needs you to help this person. This God just needs you to smile at this person or say hello or stop for two minutes and have a nice little conversation. Pray for that. It will be kind of amazing what you see starting to happen when you start paying attention to everything. And then when you're hurting, those people are going to start being like, hey, it's like the George Bailey story where he was always helping people, but then when he thought no one loved him, then suddenly all these people start coming out and helping him because, you know, he's a great guy and he was always there for everybody else. So pray for it. Just want to thank you for coming to 180 Briefs. Uh, we have Mark, our buddy from uh, Amida, who's uh, in charge of the chaplains. He's going to be speaking for us this night, and we've got a song from Liz. So thank you for all coming, and have a great night. Thanks.
cross and darkness rejoiced as though heaven had lost but then Jesus rose with our freedom in hand that's when death was arrested and my life Hello friends, uh, I'm thankful to Stephen for giving me an opportunity to share um, some thoughts with you. Um, I know with uh, COVID-19 we have to connect virtually and uh, frankly I am uh, I'm tired to connect virtually. <laughs> I want to connect in person but uh, for everyone's safety we uh, we keep this we keep this going hopefully not for long I wanted to talk with you about something that we all been dealing with for the last couple of weeks the injustice that was done to George Floyd that also surfaced um, many injustices um, recent and in the past um, down to black people whether it's police uh, or racial inequality in many other in many other ways um, and systemic ra racism that I am um, I, I I'm learning uh, even right now it's hard for me to talk about this topic because I grew up in a different country and moved here when I was um, an adult um, So I think the easiest easiest thing to do and that I did for quite some time saying that it's not my fight. Um, I don't understand how in this country right now um, people can um, be racially persecuted when we have so many uh, people on TV and the media and celebrities uh, who are black um, sports who are successful people who are su successful I have friends who are black and very successful um, and um, yeah, it was hard for me to to see racial injustice uh, the easy answer would be is some people want to remain in that um, victim mentality that was my thought that was my thought up to when um, well it's hard to pinpoint and I'm not going to do it 
but it was my thought for the most of most of my most of my time i uh, when the conversation was around uh, racial inequality i couldn't understand um but then killing of george floyd happened and i saw it um saw the whole video I don't know what happened. It just made me realize how deaf the police officer was. He heard everything. He heard, heard all the cries, but he was not interested in taking his knee off George's neck. And um, to me, suddenly it just made me realize that... Um, something that I didn't see before, I didn't want to see, or I refused to see. And uh, I had to do a devotion next day for at my work, and I was looking for thought uh, for thoughts to, to to describe what I saw, and um, and uh, I I read from Proverbs um, a verse that says. Injustice uh, creates calamity, and that's what happened in our country. Uh, and I believe we deserve this calamity that happened with all the protests that turned into violence, um, and uh, you know, people on on many different sides would uh, condemn the protests or condemn the violence and and uh, speak their minds and the feelings are raw everybody's uh um, everybody's um, ready to come up with an opinion right and uh but but the injustice created this calamity and i think uh, death of george floyd was like a final drop you know, when 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 society can't uh, hold it no more. It was um, just um, too difficult to watch. And then, um, you know, different opinions started to pop up. Some of the more, you know. Um, I um, one of them was that I'm silent because um, because I'm still processing, and I could re resonate with that. Um, mostly, I was silent, and and I can tell. I can share with you also is that uh, I've been in this country for um, since 2002 so 18 years and for that 18 years I was silent I kept saying um, this is not my this is not my fight uh, I couldn't understand Um, does God want us to be silent when injustices happen? I don't think so. I um, I, I think if we if we um, if we don't speak against the injustice, um, we're not doing our part. I want to read a verse from uh, James. Chapter 2, verse 1. It says, My dear brothers and sisters, how can you claim to have faith in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ if you favor some people over others? Well, we can read this verse or understand this verse from many different 
points of view. But I realized that I, I, maybe not even favored, I just didn't really care about what my friends who are black are going through in regards to racial inequality. Um, in James chapter 2 verse 9 it says but if you favor some people over others you are committing sin you are guilty of breaking the law now we are we are living in a, in a society that is um, very diverse very private in a way uh, what I'm going through on a day-to-day -day basis um, you probably will not know um, unless I share it with you and so I learned that many of my friends who are African-American who are black things that they were going through on a daily basis in regards to racial inequality um, they were tired to share they were tired to um, say to others they just sort of absorbed it and went with it uh, like a regular day um, and uh, everybody else thought that we live in the modern world. We live in a society where racial inequality is very minimal. Um, so when all this happened, um, I had a, a meeting. And in one of my meetings, uh, a friend of mine, uh, Julian, Julian Johnson, he is, um, he is from Florida. Um, Dr. Julian Johnson. He uh, he's also African American, and he shared some things that he thought would be helpful to those who don't understand what's going on. He said, first of all, we need to do th three things. One is to say, "I see you." to an African-American person, to a black person, we should say, I see you. The second thing is, I hear you. Uh, I want to hear you. And the third is, I want to learn from you. And I try to do that. And I, I, I started to have those conversations, learning what my brothers and sisters who are black are going through on a day-to-day -day basis in this country today or before. And their stories are real. Their stories are... Um, eye-opening how today in this country one can be stopped just because of the color of his skin be racially profiled many other stories that I'm sure you're aware of What I'm, what I'm trying to say today is that I decided not to be silent anymore. I recognized the injustice. I recognized racial inequality in this country and that it exists today.
right now. And I believe it is a sin if I uh, favor some people over the others. What does it take for racial inequality to stop? It takes all of us, white, black, yellow, red, whoever we are. It takes all of us, all of our voices, collective voices, whatever prejudices you may have in your heart. Remember James 2, chapter 1. James chapter 2, verse 1. My dear brothers and sisters, how can you claim faith in our glorious Lord Jesus if you favor some people over the others? Thank you for uh, listening to me. Um, hope um, hope that um, it it's a little bit helpful, and um, in our environment today. And I, I hope that as followers of Christ, uh, we we take it to heart to fight injustices just as Jesus did. Thank you, guys. Blessings. Bye.